and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to November 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. We check out Sinclair's Interface 2. We review some older games and take a look at some newer titles. And we have a brand new section to end the show. But first, it's back into the time machine in November 1984. Activision announced they are to release eight games for the Spectrum, pleasing game players as they will finally get their hands on previous console-only games. Games announced will be Beam Rider, Enduro, Hero, Pitfall 2, River Raid, Space Shuttle, Zenji and the Designer's Pencil. Fuller Microsystems, who went into liquidation a few months ago, have been bought out by rival peripheral manufacturer Nordic. Nordic say they are working hard to maintain the good image of Fuller without any of the delivery or service issues that were associated with the fallen company. In a previous show we heard of a new distribution system that allowed games to be delivered electronically to special machines located within game shops. Another similar system will also be providing this service by the name of Softshop, Customers buy tickets that are then inserted into the machine. The game of their choice is then loaded onto tape at 16 times normal speed. Cassette inlays are printed and the customer walks away with their purchase. The new system comes from Rose Tech, who, working with top software suppliers, anticipate the first 60 units to be installed by January, already loaded with the top 50 games for various machines. Sinclair is developing a new portable computer based on Spectrum technology. The machine will be fully compatible with the existing Spectrum and Spectrum Plus machines and could be available as early as mid-1985. The battery-powered Spectrum is just one of the projects in the pipeline, Sinclair say, that can run from new battery technology developed at the company's MetaLab division. The machine will have a single microdrive and will use flat-screen technology that Sinclair are using for their Pocket TV. With the launch of Ultimate Play the Game's latest title, Nightmare, the collective journals of various magazine staff are well and truly on the floor. Quality and style are something that surpasses every other game for the Spectrum, and reviewers everywhere have been left astonished as to how this could be achieved on the humble Spectrum. The game went straight into the charts at number one, and is now ideally suited for the Christmas period. American software company Parker Brothers have pulled out of the software market in the UK. Any and all products planned for 1985 have now been withdrawn, and that includes the previously announced ROM cartridges for Sinclair's Interface 2. Parker say the market is no longer viable for ROM games due to their cost, and the fact that the whole ROM game format never really took off for the Spectrum. You can see more about Interface 2 in the feature later on in this episode. And now onto the top selling games. With the festive season rapidly approaching, there are a raft of new games hitting the charts, with the top 10 changing week by week. Games making the charts this month include Night Law, the game from Ultimate Play the Game that astounded many gamers and reviewers. Jet Set Willy, Matthew Smith's follow up to Manic Miner. Danger Mouse, a game based on the popular cartoon character released by Creative Sparks. Darkstar, Design Designs, Super Fast 3D Shooter. Steve Davis Snooker, the popular player gives his name to this game by CDS. Underworld, Saberman takes on a new challenge in Ultimate Play the Game's second release. And Turmoil. Bug Bite gives us their take on the platform genre. And that was the news and top selling games for November 1984. In 1983, Sinclair and Scion announced to the world that they would be working together on a new interface for the Spectrum. This new unit would allow games to be loaded instantly from cartridges. 
similar to the game's consoles and of course the Spectrum's rival, the Commodore 64. Another benefit of this system would be to throw a spanner in the works of the increasing piracy market. It would be far more costly to duplicate a ROM cartridge than a cassette and impossible for the playground pirates. The interface was duly launched in October and was only available by mail order initially. At launch there were just three titles available. Planetoids, the arcade clone, Batgammon, the board game, and Space Raiders, the Space Invader clone. All products were by Scion. Slightly later came Chess. And it wasn't until December that the final six arrived. Those were Hungry Horace, Horace and the Spiders, and the four 16K Ultimate Play the Game titles, Jetpack, Psst, Transam, and Cookie. It's obvious by looking at these that apart from Space Raiders, Ultimate were actually padding out what was otherwise a poor range of games. The unit itself was not much larger than an average joystick adapter, being 11.5cm by 90cm, including the edge connector, and only 3cm high. It included two joystick ports, but they were non-standard, so no Kempston or Sinclair options. It had a small flap on top that lifted up and allowed you to plug cartridges in. It also had a pass-through port, but this only worked with the Sinclair printer, which was a bit of an oversight really. Internally the device consisted of a fairly simple PCB setup, with a single chip just to handle the joystick ports. The rest of the work was done by the Spectrum itself, using existing connections and logic. The cartridges came in cardboard boxes, a little larger than their cassette counterparts. Inside was a thin piece of moulded plastic that held the ROM in place. The cartridges themselves were nice and small, and including the edge connector measured just 4.5 by 5.3 centimetres, and only 1.2 centimetres thick. A plastic housing protected the innards and a small red rubber skirt protected the connector. Compared to other cartridges they were tiny for their day, just a little larger than those for the Nintendo DS, and slightly smaller than the Game Boy. But they were much smaller than the equivalent Commodore or Atari cartridges. Connecting the unit was easy, just plug it in, obviously making sure the power was off first. Open the flap and slot the cartridge in, and you're ready to play. Turning the computer on would instantly load the game. No more waiting, no more screeches and no more yellow lines. The Spectrum recognised the unit was connected, and that the ROM cartridge was plugged in. It would then page out its own ROM and page in the ROM of the cartridge. This was ideal for gamers, but there were problems, and all of them could have been overcome really, and it would have meant a better solution, and a better device that probably had a longer life than it did. Firstly, the joystick ports were configured in a strange way. Port 1 was mapped to keys 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, while Port 2 was mapped to 6, 7, 8, 9 and 0. This meant that normal joysticks, like the Kempston ones, didn't work. Neither, so I found out, did the Sinclair joysticks, even with their own ROM games. So to enjoy a good game of Jetpack I had to revert to using the keyboard. Secondly, the pass-through port that only worked with Sinclair printers. That was a massive oversight, as this device had to be the last in the chain if you had more than one thing connected. Thirdly, and most importantly, the games were limited to 16K only. This was because the contents of the ROM had to replace the Spectrum's own ROM as it paged them in and out. Fourthly, the games were more expensive than their cassette counterparts. And number five, there wasn't enough of them. Only ten. And lastly, there was no safeguard to stop users plugging in cartridges while the power was on, causing untold damage. The interface was only compatible with the 16, 48K, 48K Plus and 128K machines. This was due to Amstrad changing the rear connector signals for the Plus 2s and Plus 3s. Limiting the games to 16K was a serious problem, as mentioned before. This also meant that internal ROM routines of the Spectrum could not be used when a cartridge was plugged in, a problem if you wanted to save game data for example. The units look nice, and suits the 48k machines really well. It worked really well too had it not been for the problems. I could easily see this as being a big seller. As it is, it wasn't, and they now sell for large sums of money on eBay along with the cartridges. Other companies noticed these problems and quickly jumped on the bandwagon, releasing their own ROM interfaces that fixed some of the issues. 
Kempston released the Kempston Pro interface that provided not only Kempston joystick support but also Cursor and Sinclair Zone standard as well. The unit was the smaller of the full feature clones and smaller than the original and it also offered a full pass-through port. Next came Ram Electronics who released two versions of its Ram Turbo interface. Each supported Kempston, Cursor and Sinclair joysticks and had pass-through ports. The later version also included a reset button. This interface was slightly larger than the original, being the largest of the clones. And lastly came AGF, releasing a cut-down version that only allowed for ROM cartridge games. There was no joystick interface, but luckily it provided a pass-through port, so you could easily use an existing joystick interface if you had one. The limited number of games was a longer-lasting problem though, and despite promises of more games, in particular from Parker Brothers, who said they would release several titles including Popeye, Cuba and Gyrus, the actual number never got past 10. Well actually Sinclair did release another one, but this was a system test cartridge, available only to test centres. Interface 2 slipped into obscurity, but today there are many other unofficial cartridges available. Paul Farrow, who runs the ZX Resource Centre website, has full details of how to make your own cartridges, plus some he has made himself that do a wide range of things. You can get the Sinclair Diagnostic cartridge. You can get a cartridge that includes the Parker Brothers games. You can get one that upgrades a 48k Spectrum to a 128k version. And you can get one that includes emulators like the ZX80 and ZX81. There's even one that emulates a microdrive. I could see what Sinclair were trying to do, but it seems they overlooked several important factors during the design process, probably trying to cut back on costs. If they had got things right though, an interface with a full pass-through port that supported different joystick standards and cheaper games and more of them, who knows, subsequent Spectrum models may have included a cartridge slot as standard. And how very different things could have been today. Super Chopper was launched in 1984 by Software Projects under their budget label Software Super Savers, selling for an affordable £2.99. The inlay had instructions in various languages and told the story of Pete the Pilot, whose job was to rescue survivors of a plane crash over enemy territory, dodging missiles and avoiding the ground as much as possible. The game itself was a mix of other helicopter games such as Airwolf or Blue Thunder or even Krakatoa. The survivors are scattered over several screens and you have to navigate around various bits of scenery in a bit to collect them. Each section had a different number of survivors, indicated on the control panel, and you had a limited amount of fuel to do it in. There were six levels in total, each having to be completed three times before moving on. The levels had different scenery, but the obstacles remained in the same place, so once you knew the layout, flying around became easier. Depending on the level, the missiles also changed. Sometimes you got genies on magic carpets, sometimes birds, and on later levels you got planes and even Martians. The graphics are passable as you can see, and are nice and smooth. The flip screen effect though can sometimes cause problems, as quite a few times I ran into missiles before actually seeing them. Your chopper is equipped with a gun, which can be used to destroy the missiles, but they have a nasty habit of regenerating in exactly the same place, so you have to be careful. Control is very responsive, making navigation easy and you can get out of some really tight scrapes quickly. Sound is kept to a minimum, with the sound of the helicopter flying around, shooting and explosions. And that's about it while you're playing. Reality has to be suspended when playing this game though, as with most games really. I mean, flying a helicopter into a cloud does not cause it to explode in real life, but hey, it's only a game. The trick is to treat everything on screen as dangerous. The gameplay is just about right, providing a nice little collect em up with the right amount of difficulty. I really enjoyed playing this game and got quite far without too much trouble. The 
good playable release then from Software Projects. Why not give it a try? Reveal was released in 1989 by Mastertronic and cost just £1.99. You can't even buy it on eBay for that now. The cover is packed with text limiting the cover graphics, which does not really indicate what the game is about, unless you look really carefully. This game was part of the Flippy Flippy range, which had the Spectrum version on one side and the Amstrad on the other. You play a member of the Planetary Liberation Force, whose job it is to travel to various planets and free them from the darkness. How is this achieved? Maybe by just turning on a light perhaps, but no, you have to travel around a 3D grid changing the base colour. Before each level the full grid, or world, is shown, and then becomes invisible, and you have to travel around switching all the tiles back on. Once the world is saved, the exit tile is enabled, allowing you to travel to the next world. You have to be careful though, because it is possible to become trapped when the exit tile is enabled, as some of the blocks close off and cannot be used, and it's very frustrating to find yourself blocked in and unable to complete the level. Also, levels have to be completed in a time limit, so there's no time just to stand about and plan your route. There are also aliens wandering about, sometimes bringing the darkness back to previously illuminated tiles. The game is a mixture of Marble Madness and Cuba, and the concept is simple enough. The time limit is sometimes a little too harsh though, and more time would have been nice in my opinion, especially on the early levels, when you are just trying to get used to the control system. The control system itself isn't bad, but is almost impossible to use with a joystick because it just doesn't work for isometric 3D games. Using the keyboard is a much better option, and you get a chance to set your own keys that correspond to diagonal movement. Graphics are monochrome, which was normal for this type of game, and are smooth and well defined. Sound reminds me of early Quicksilver games, and is adequate for the game. Remove the frustrating game ending blocks and the tight time limits, and this could have been a great little game. I know it only cost £1.99, but it could have been so much better. If this is the sort of game you like, give it a try. I think you'll either love it or hate it. Boogie Boy was an arcade racing game released in 1985 by Tatsumi. The game was simple enough, drive around several different courses in the shortest possible time, avoiding collisions, collecting points and extra time, and jumping over obstacles and other buggies. The game was converted to most home formats, with different degrees of success, so how would the Spectrum version compare? Without the dedicated 3D hardware of the arcade, this version wasn't too bad. Released in 1988 by Elite Systems in both 48 and 1 to 8K flavours. The 1 to 8K version has nice music and better sounds, but the gameplay on both machines is the same. The game maintains the large chunky graphics of the arcade, but I think they're just a little too large, giving very little room to manoeuvre on screen. The courses are the same as the arcade, although they seem shortened, and it takes less time to get to notable sections like tunnels and bridges. Graphics wise it's not too bad, the buggy is colourful, the tracks get close to the arcade, but things do move slower, and I suppose that's to be expected. Control is sometimes sluggish, as is the gameplay, and it takes a while to get used to them. Things are more difficult due to the previously mentioned large buggy. Most of the arcade elements are here, rocks, gates, flags, and even the sand resembles the real thing, but there's no tumbling buggy when you hit something, instead you just explode. The gear change was tricky too. The Spectrum version automatically drops you to lower gear after a crash, and then stops you from switching up until you hit a certain speed. Gameplay wise I would have said average, but after 30 minutes it began to grow on me. Maybe because I had adjusted to the controls and the collision detection, which can sometimes be off slightly. The large buggy does reduce playability though, and the sluggish controls often cause frustration, and the removal of the tumbling buggy just slows things down. 
If you decide to give this game a go, give yourself time to get used to the controls and mechanics. That would probably mean about four or five games, because then you'll get a better game. Released in 2009 by Retroworks, Gommy Medieval Defender is certainly not a unique game, and the concept has been done several times before, but for me this game just does it slightly better. The idea is a simple one, as are many of the best games. You have to defend the castle from invading troops armed only with a supply of large rocks. As the enemy arrive they begin to slowly climb the wall, and our hero must grab a rock and hurl it down, killing them. New rocks appear at either the left or right hand side of the screen, depending on where Gommy last threw the rock from. Initial levels are easy, and ease you into the game, but things soon start to hot up as other elements are added, like parts of the wall that stop the rock from falling. These though can be used to your advantage, as you can drop rocks onto them and let them roll off killing the enemy, so there is some strategy involved. As the levels progress, so does the speed and number of enemies, until it becomes a frantic grab and drop fest. Every now and again an item will appear on top of the wall, and collecting this will have a different effect. Some of them freeze the troops giving you more time to kill them, which is a welcome break from frantic gameplay. There are also boss levels, where the gameplay changes, and you have to fire things from cannons to kill the bosses as they rain down small rocks on you. Again, another break from the gameplay, and all adds up to a great game. Graphics are very colourful, with some really nice level introductions. Music and sound are great too, and control is very responsive. All the things you need for a great game. Gameplay is just right as well, and you always want to go back for just one more try. Good game then that you should try the next time you have half an hour spare, but don't be surprised if you find yourself playing just a little bit longer. Welcome to the new section of the show, Type-In Corner. Slipped in for no other reason than I recently came across several tapes full of type-ins, bringing back many memories of hours spent typing listings from magazines. On the tapes are a few different games, quite a few good ones, quite a few rubbish ones. Some already available on World of Spectrum, many of them not. This episode's game is Searcher, that appeared in an April edition of Popular Computing Weekly. Listings often gave a representation of the game depending on the magazine, and Popular Computing Weekly used nicely drawn images. The one for Searcher looked tempting. The listing didn't, though. It included two machine code routines, one to scroll the screen and one to invert it to give an explosion effect. Luckily, these were short data statements. Unluckily, when I'd loaded the game from one of my tapes, it didn't work. I have a vague memory of it not working, but saving it anyway, but never getting back to it. So now it was time to debug it. After a few minutes, I discovered there were two problems. First, the author had used a variable called rnd, and guess what? He'd used it to assign a random number using the rnd function. Once that was fixed, the next bit was the machine code which crashed the game. This was pure guesswork, and it came down to the data statements with a 6 that looked like an 8, due to the poor print. Once that was changed, it worked. So, was it worth it? For a basic game in early 1983, it's not actually bad. I've seen much worse. The landscape scrolls from right to left, aliens appear randomly, and you can move up, down, left and right, and obviously fire.
Once you shoot enough of them, walls start appearing, and this is when the game becomes challenging. Yes, the graphics flicker during scroll and everything stops when you play sound effects. There's no on-screen lives or scoring, but this is exactly as it was published. It's a free basic game, and this is the kind of thing that future programmers lapped up. For some, memories of typing in games listing is a real mixed bag. Frustration at not having them work, anger when they crashed and you hadn't saved them, delight when they worked, and pride when they didn't work and you managed to debug them yourself. It's all part of our history. So join us next time for another look at typing games in Typing Corner. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.